trivialize this day in this service by uh, saying things trite. So uh, even though the IT department has made sure that they, I know where I can wander and where I can't, they've obviously heard that I wander. I'm not going to wander today. Um, I do want to say thank you. I, I, uh, and I, I've said this before, and I say it again. I think there is probably very few other denominations that I feel more akin to uh, than the Salvation Army. Um, I've always believed, from my uh, early, in the late 90s, when I was invited to speak at a number of events nationally, and then into the 2000s, every time I'm with you, as you fight about brass bands and uniforms, <laughs> I'm reminded that your roots are the roots that uh, most people talk about when they talk about the 21st century and the need for the church to be the church as a missional presence. There is no group of people more poised to be that than the Salvation Army. Uh, what uh, Rene Padilla, the great Latin American theologian, calls uh, mission integral. That sounds more French than Spanish, sorry. <laughs> Uh, but that's what he calls it, integral mission. <coughs> this, the witness of the church, he calls it, uh, where most of other denominations have divided that between social justice and evangelism. Uh, the call for the 21st century is a missional presence of churches that actually hold those in, in wonderful, creative tension. And who better than, <coughs> than the Salvation Army, who understands what he calls the witness of the gospel in both word and deed. So thank you for inviting me, because I always feel present. I don't know what I feel like in a uniform. I've never been good at fitting in. I've always struggled with this, but thank you for having me. For most of you, this is probably not your first Holy Week service ever. Uh, probably you're the faithful that show up to these things. It's an interesting series of days where we march toward Good Friday. Strange name, isn't it? Good Friday, considering what the day really represents. And my guess is that this is not the first time you've heard the story of the arrest and the trial and the crucifixion of Jesus. The story so full of emotion and confusion and death. The words I was given, was given to speak to were those words from the cross. Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. We're at Golgotha. Where do you see yourself in the story? I heard a biblical scholar one time suggest, he said, where you seat yourself or you stand in this text makes an enormous difference to how you hear or even interpret the story itself. I found that increasingly helpful. Often when I'm reading the Gospels, I think about where I place myself in the story. Sanders says that, the theologian that talked about this says, that we're often tempted to take the wrong seats. We see ourselves probably different than we really are. For instance, we tell the story of the prodigal son. We may cast ourselves as the prodigal son. Some of us are comfortable in being the gracious father, but surely not the self-righteous older brother. We take our seats with the father, thinking this story applies to someone else, when we might take, and we might do better to take the seat of the younger or the older son and apply it to ourselves. Today, at the beginning of this Holy Week in the story, Good Friday, where do you stand? Where do you find yourself sitting? Are you the crowd of faithful, mostly women, interestingly enough? Isn't it interesting that it's the women at the cross and that it's the women at the tomb? Listening to Jesus grant forgiveness to his oppressors. While he sits, while he's, he's on the cross on either side of other people, crying in painful hope for a relief of the agony of their convictedness, this Jesus turns and says, Father, forgive them. 
Are you one of those who needed forgiveness? Even while at the same time, out of knowing you needed it, or for that matter, wanting it. Maybe you didn't even know that you needed it. Maybe you didn't even know that you even wanted it. And the story that, that is spoken about this morning is all about forgiveness. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. It's about a loving son's appeal to his father to forgive those who have wronged and betrayed him. Betrayed. In these last few months, I've experienced a stinging betrayal, one in which years of trust building proved to mean nothing to this group of people who simply wanted their own way, no matter what the costs. In a small way, I've experienced what Jesus must have felt, the desire to strike out at the betrayal, to, the, to hurt those who were hurting me, to justify myself, of that I was sure. I was justified to do that in the feelings that I had. But this holy, weak passion story turns on a dime at this traumatic moment. The radical center of the good news of Jesus Christ is revealed in this simple action of forgiveness plea for grace from Father God. Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. And in that passionate plea, you are given a window into the amazing heart of God, how he sees us, and the lengths to which he will go to actually bring us back to him. Forgiveness. Uh, forgiveness. The elusive action that seems so difficult to offer and so remarkably misunderstood. Some of you remember the story of the man in rural Pennsylvania that lined up a number of young Am Amish children in the school that he had invaded and then shot them. And you may remember that shortly after that shooting, reporters from TV and print were startled by the parents of the children reaching out to the wife and the children of the killer. I remember the discussions that were going on at CNN and its inevitable nothingness of dialogue. <laughs> Asking the question, are they crazy? Why don't they feel anger? Are they, are they in denial? Do they not feel a need for revenge? It startled the world, but it shouldn't have. They were simply acting out of the life of their Savior, whom they served, Jesus. Do you want to be more like Jesus? Then act like him. And they did. This forgiveness, this forgiveness so often sought, but so rarely given without reluctance. How many times must we forgive, the disciples asked. It's like the minimal question, right? It, I love that. They, the other person, who is my neighbor, is the other minimal question in the gospel. The question, it's the question that someone asks so that they can figure out how long it will take before they can act with retribution. How many times do I have to forgive before I can really strike out? Seventy times seven must have been a tragic answer for them. So exacting. So obviously long. You could see them having to count as they were forgiving, and then finally losing count, like I often do, and having to start again. We don't like to forgive. It's not natural. And frankly, it doesn't seem very satisfying, as satisfying as simply getting even. My friend, Regine Ubara Weho, can attest to this. She now is a professor of social work at the University of Manitoba. But long before that appointment, she hid in the bush outside of the city of Butari in Rwanda, a Tutsi. She watched two brothers struck down by machetes, swung by neighbors and friends. She hid for two months in the bush, years of healing 
it's difficult to forgive. And she thought she had gotten to that point of forgiveness, but imagine her horror when years later her youngest sister decides to marry a Hutu. And the feelings of anger and bitterness caught in her throat. Forgiveness, it seems, for us takes time. She thought she had released herself from the prisons constructed by so many unwilling to forgive. In fact, she was involved in trauma counseling, and that was what she did, taught people how to forgive. But forgetting is not easy. Just forgiving is not enough. The scars still remain like scabs wanting to be picked in us. That's the way we are. Even to this day, April is a difficult time for her. It was the 20th anniversary of that horrific week in that <coughs> month. And we know when we talk to her on the phone, she's different in those weeks. It's important to remember that forgiveness, even if it is willingly given, emerges from the deepest places of our living. But in this way, we can be sure this one Jesus gave it all. We are told that Jesus felt all that we feel. He experienced all that we have experienced. And don't you forget that this afternoon. Don't you find it curious that the first words spoken from Jesus in the agony on the cross is forgive them. Blood, torn sinew, crushed bones as the nails ripped through their hands, and the crowds around him hungry for death and a chance to embarrass him, calling out, throwing accusations and condemnations at him that were unjustified and unfair, such jolting pain at the cross as it thuds down into the socket with an agonizing sound. And his first words, our Father, forgive them. Even more striking in these words is he melds forgiveness to their ignorance. Have you ever thought of that? For they know not what they do. I've heard too often that you can't be forgiven for something that you remain ignorant to. Obviously not in this case. And that's what I want to say to you this afternoon. You see, the cross is a preemptive strike on our ignorance. Our absolute lack of reality, how deeply unaware we are of our need for forgiveness. We are the deeply spiritual. We are the pharisaical holy people in the crowd at this moment. Unaware of our need for forgiveness. And Jesus, with a preemptive strike, cries out, forgive them. They're ignorant. They do not know what they are doing. And with those words, you and I are set free. With those words, you and I are liberated to become the people of forgiveness and love to the world. Just for a moment, let's just pause in silent prayer. With those words, O oh God, spoken by your Son, we are set free. With those words, and with his death and his resurrection, we are called to responsible living. 
this amazing love. Pour it out so that we might be amazing love to those around us. Thank you. In Jesus' name.